Hello, I am Matti van Oef, and together with Tom van Goetem, we will be presenting timeless timing attacks. Tom van Goetem is a researcher at the Distronet Group in KU Leuven in Belgium. He's a fanatic web and network security enthusiast, and he likes to exploit side channel leaks in browsers and more general in web platforms as well. I am Matti van Oef, I'm a postdoc at NYU Abu Dhabi, and I'll later this year be starting as a professor at KU Leuven in Belgium. I'm interested in wireless and network security, in software security, and also a bit in applied crypto. And previously, I discovered a crack attack against WPA2 and the RC4 no more attack. Now in this presentation, we'll be talking about timing attacks and timing leaks. So let me start with some, ex some examples of timing leaks. In the top left corner, we can see a straightforward timing leak where depending on some secret condition, extra computation is performed. And here, the execution time, so was the response time of, for instance, the web application will leak whether the condition was true or false. In the top right, we have a for loop that iterates through all the elements in an array. And the for loop is terminated once an element is found with a certain secret condition. In other words, the number of iterations that are being executed depend on some kind of secret information. And this again also means that the execution time of this for loop leaks sensitive information to an adversary. Finally, at the bottom, we have an if test that checks whether an array is empty or not. And if it is not empty, extra computation is performed. And here you can imagine a web app where you can search through secret documents using a keyword. And then this code would leak whether this keyword is present in a secret document or not. Now, how are these timing leaks exploited in practice? Well, the attacker would first need to connect to the target server. The attacker then sends a possibly large amount of requests to the server. And for each request, the server will measure how long it takes to receive a response. And then the attacker will compare two sets of um, timing measurements, namely the baseline on the target. And what do I mean with baseline here? Well, with baseline, I, for instance, mean the first example here, where then the secret condition evaluates to false, and the adversary knows that the secret condition evaluates to false, and the adversary will use this, that as a baseline, and the target request is then a request where the adversary doesn't know what the secret condition evaluates to, but based on the response time, the adversary can then derive whether the secret condition and the target request is also false or whether it is in fact true. And to check whether there is a difference between the baseline and the target request, we will be using statistical tests uh, to determine whether there really is a significant difference or not. Now, there are several factors that influence the success rate of a timing attack. The first one is the network connection between the attacker and the victim server. And in particular, the higher the jitter of this connection, the worse the performance of the timing attack. Now, the attacker can mitigate this to some extent by, for instance, moving closer to the target. Um, so in practice, that could be renting um, a server in the same cloud provider where the victim is also located. And I also want to remark here that the jitter is present both on the upstream path, so in the requests, and in the downstream path, so in the responses. Another important factor is the size of the timing leak. So it's much easier to exploit a large timing leak, say of 50 milliseconds, than it is to exploit a small timing leak of, say, 5 microseconds. And finally, the last important factor is the number of measurements that an adversary can make. 
And in particular, the more timing measurements that an adversary can make, the better the performance of the timing attack will be. Anton will now show a graphical illustration of a timing attack. Thank you for that introduction, Mati. Uh, so now let's see how such a remote timing attack works uh, with a visual representation. Uh, so we have our attacker on the left side sending the request to the server. Um, and this request goes over the internet, then is processed by the server, and response is generated and sent back to the attacker. Um, the attacker will then measure how long it took uh, bef well, between sending the request and receiving the response. And in this case, this was a bit over three seconds. Then the attacker uh, stores this uh, timing value and then he will probably need to uh, make multiple requests. So he starts sending the next request. Uh, but here on the third hop, uh, there was a small delay, uh, also causing a delay uh, in the, the arrival of the response. Um, so this means that because of this uh, jitter, uh, the attacker will need to make multiple measurements and then um, apply some uh, statistical analysis in order to reveal the true uh, processing time of the server. So we did some measurements uh, to see how many requests the attacker would actually require. Um, so we uh, varied the uh, number uh, or the, the difference in, in timing uh, of the processing time. Uh, between 5 microseconds and 50 microseconds. And then we determined how many requests an attacker would need uh, to achieve a 95% accuracy. Um, so our attacker was located uh, in our university network, uh, located in Belgium, and then we set up uh, servers across the world. Um, so, and then we performed the attack to see uh, how many requests were required. So um, to detect a timing difference of 50 microseconds uh, with a server in the EU, with the attacker also located in the EU, um, a total of 333 requests were required. Now, when the server was further away, uh, so for instance, when it was located in the US, uh, more requests were required. So um, in this case, for 50 microseconds, uh, well over uh, 4,000 requests were required uh, to detect this difference. Um, you can also see that as the timing difference uh, became smaller, also the attacker required uh, more measurements. Um, so um, for 20 microseconds, it was uh, close to 3,000 requests that were needed uh, for the server in the EU, uh, growing to uh, 23,000 for 10 microseconds, and uh, for a timing difference of 5 microseconds, we found that it was not possible uh, to do this uh, with a maximum set to 100,000 requests. So we were thinking, like, how can we uh, improve these remote timing attacks? And that's how we came to the timeless timing attacks. So we know that uh, if we rely on uh, absolute response timing, this will not be very uh, reliable because it, there will be always uh, this uh, jitter that's included in every request because of uh, well because the the request needs to traverse over the internet uh, and so does the response. So then we thought, okay, then maybe let's get rid of the notion of time. And then that's why we call these attack timeless. Um, so instead of relying on this sequential timing measurements, uh, we can try to exploit concurrency and only consider the order of the responses. So we don't use any uh, absolute timing measurements anymore uh, in these timing measurements. We just look at the response order. Um, and this means, as a very important side effect, is that these timeless timing attacks are completely unaffected by network jitter. So let's see uh, how this works in practice. 
Uh, so again, we have our attacker and the server. Uh, but now the attacker is not just sending one request, but he will be sending two requests uh, that are contained in the same packet. Um, so these two requests arrive simultaneously at the server and are uh, processed concurrently. Um, and because the light pink uh, request took less time to process, uh, the light blue uh, response will be generated first and sent first to the attacker, um, allowing the attacker to, to detect that uh, this, uh, well, this request uh, required less processing time. So if in this case we have some jitter on the way to the server, uh, it will not affect um, anything uh, because the both requests will still arrive exactly at the same time at the server because they're contained in a single uh, packet. And then they can be processed simultaneously um, at the server side. And again, we see the same result. Thank you, Tom. So what are the requirements of a timeless timing attack? Well, first and for all, the requests need to arrive at the same time at the server. The server needs to process these requests in parallel, so concurrently. And the order of the responses needs to reflect the difference in the execution time on the server. So let ex let's explore these three requirements in more detail. So the first requirement that both requests arrive simultaneously at the server can be fulfilled in two manners. Namely, we can either rely on multiplexing or on encapsulation. And with multiplexing, our example is the HTTP2 protocol. And this is because with the HTTP2 protocol, two requests can be sent simultaneously over the same connection. In fact, a single TCP packet can carry multiple HTTP2 requests that will be processed concurrently once they arrive at the server. For encapsulation, there our example is the HTTP1 protocol, because the HTTP1 protocol on its own does not allow you to send two requests in parallel. However, when we exploit HTTP1 over Tor or over VPN, then we can send two HTTP requests at the same time over Tor or over the VPN network. So let me illustrate these two cases graphically. So for multiplexing, we have the HTTP2 example, where here on top, you can see the two HTTP2 requests in gray. And the adversary will assure that these two HTTP2 requests are sent in a single TCP packet. This assures that these two requests will arrive simultaneously at the server. For the encapsulation case, we have the HTTP1 example, where here again at the bottom, we have two HTTP1 requests shown in gray. These two HTTP1 requests are sent in different TCP connections, meaning they are also encapsulated in two different TCP packets shown in red here, and each TCP packet is then encapsulated in a different Tor cell. Now what the adversary now does is the adversary assures that these two Tor cells will be aggregated into a single TCP packet. And once this TCP packet arrives at the Tor Onion servers that we are targeting, then the Onion servers will process these two requests uh, effectively in parallel. Now for the second requirement, the second requirement is that these two requests then have to be handled in parallel by the server. And whether this is the case is application dependent. We have found that in most cases, applications can handle requests in parallel. One possible exception is when you target uh, cryptographic operations because those often have to be handled in a certain sequential order. The third requirement then is that the order of the responses will reflect which request finished processing first. And in practice, 
That means that the server must immediately send a response after it finished processing a request. Additionally, the adversary must be able to reliably recover the response order. In other words, when the responses are sent back from the victim server to the adversary, the network should not be reordering these responses. Now, in our experience, in our experiments, we noticed that these two responses generally follow the same network path, meaning the order is maintained. But even if for some reason the order of the responses is switched, is switched along uh, the network path, then the adversary can still rely on TCP fields such as the TCP sequence numbers or the TCP timestamps to recover the order in which the server sent both responses. So what is now the performance of a timeless timing attack? Well, let's first and for all recall the performance of a traditional timing attack, where Tom explained the first part of this table here. On this slide, we also added the performance of a traditional timing attack over the LAN on the local host. For instance, we can see that if we want to exploit a timing leak of five microseconds over the local host, this would require a bit more than 40 requests um, in a traditional timing attack. In contrast, if you look at our new timeless timing attacks, we can, for example, exploit a timing leak of five microseconds using roughly 50 request pairs. All important here is that the timing leak can then be exploited no matter where the adversary is located on the internet. And this is in contrast to traditional timing attacks, because with traditional timing attacks, we were not able to exploit the timing leak of five microseconds over the internet, while for our timeless timing attacks, we can. On top of that, I want to highlight that with the timeless timing attacks, we were able to exploit a timing leak of just 100 nanoseconds, while with the traditional timing attacks, the best we could exploit was a timing leak of 150 nanoseconds when the adversary was in the same LAN or local host. And in fact, over the internet, a traditional timing attack at best could exploit a timing leak of 50 microseconds. And this really shows that timeless timing attacks are an order of a magnitude more powerful than traditional timing attacks. So that covers how direct timing attacks work. It's also possible to perform timeless timing attacks in a cross-site setting and to perform timeless timing attacks against Wi-Fi authentication. And Tom will now elaborate on the cross-site timing attack scenario. So these cross-site timing attacks, um, they are a bit different from the direct timing attacks that we were talking about before, uh, because in this case, it will not be the attacker who's directly connecting to the targeted server, uh, but it will be the victim sending requests. But still, these requests are triggered by the attacker uh, by launching some malicious JavaScript code. And this could happen uh, when the victim lands on a malicious website, uh, for instance, by clicking on a link um, or if there's a malicious advertisement being shown or if this victim has a really urgent need uh, to look at some cute animal videos and then ends up on the website of the attacker. Um, so these requests that are triggered by the attacker with the JavaScript, uh, they will uh, include the cookies. So this means that the server will process the request uh, using the victim's authentication. And um, once the re re request has been processed, uh, the attacker can still observe uh, the order of the response. Uh, for instance, when he's using the fetch API, uh, he can look at which promise results first. Uh, and this will leak, uh, or this might leak uh, sensitive information that the victim has shared uh, with the website. So we actually applied this uh, timing attack, this cross-site timing attack, uh, to uh, the search functionality in HackerOne. 
uh, where we were able to leak information about uh, private undisclosed reports. So one of the key differences is that uh, with direct time index is that here the attacker does not have direct control over the network. Uh, this is because the browser uh, can choose how to send the request to the kernel and the kernel will then send it to the server. Uh, so we will need another technique uh, to make sure that the two requests are uh, joined into a single packet. And in order to do so, uh, we can leverage TCP congestion control. Uh, so this mechanism will uh, prevent the client from sending very large number of packets at once. Um, and instead, the attacker will have, uh, sorry, the client will need to uh, wait for an acknowledgement from the server uh, before uh, more packets can be sent. So once, as soon as the uh, client is waiting for um, the acknowledgement from the server, uh, the any other requests that are made, uh, well, their data will be stored uh, in the queue. Um, and uh, they will be merged together into a single packet. So the attack looks fairly simple. Um, so first we make a, a post request with a sufficiently long body. Um, and then immediately after uh, we make the two target requests. So the one will be for the baseline. Um, and then the other one is uh, well the target URL for which we want to see if it matches the same uh, timing as the baseline or whether it takes longer or shorter. Okay, so let's see how this works in practice then. Um, so here we show uh, the, the victim's packet queue. Um, the TCP packets send, that are being queued uh, to be sent to the server. Um, so first, the attacker makes this POST request, uh, which already sends off a number of TCP packets. Um, but there will be also some packets that cannot be sent yet, um, because we need to wait for the acknowledgement from the server, and they'll be added to the queue. So uh, here, every uh, square uh, represents a single TCP packet. Um, so then, uh, the second line of code is where the attacker will make a request for the baseline URL. Um, and as you can see here, it's represented with this uh, pink, uh, light pink. And then uh, the, sec the, the third line of code will be the attacker sending uh, the request for the target URL, uh, represented as the darker pink. Um, so as you can see, um, both requests will be added to the same uh, TCP packet. Um, and then later on, uh, when uh, the client has received uh, enough su or sufficient uh, acknowledgements from the server, uh, it's possible to send all the remaining uh, packets that are in the queue. Uh, and you, as you can see, uh, the light and dark pink uh, requests uh, will be both in a single TCP packet, which is exactly what we need uh, to perform our timeless timing attacks. So in this presentation, we already uh, discussed the direct time index, uh, where the attacker connects directly to the server. Then what I was just talking about are the cross site time index. And then now, uh, Mati will be talking about a third attack uh, scenario where we use uh, timeless time attacks to break uh, Wi-Fi authentication. So it is also possible to perform timeless timing attacks against Wi-Fi. And in particular, we're going to exploit the ePWD protocol that can be used in WPA2 or even WPA3 enterprise networks. So most enterprise networks, they use certificates to authenticate the server and sometimes also to authenticate the user. 
However, this can be quite annoying to configure. So in practice, a small but significant amount of networks rely on the ePWD protocol instead to authenticate a user using a username and password. And when using these enterprise authentication protocols, the authentication happens between the client and the authentication server. And here the authentication server is commonly a free radius server. And the access point will simply forward messages between the client and the authentication server. Now, because the authentication server can be located anywhere on the internet, the communication between the access point and the authentication server is typically protected using a TLS tunnel, and this TLS tunnel is called a RADSEC connection. Now, the EAP PWD protocol that we will be targeting uses the so-called hash to curve algorithm to verify a password. Unfortunately, a timing leak was discovered in this algorithm. Uh, this was called a dragon blood attack. However, against EAP PWD, this timing leak was fairly small and it did not appear possible to combine multiple timing measurements in a more powerful attack. So in other words, it seemed almost impossible to exploit this timing leak, at least against EAP PWD. However, by using the timeless timing attack, we are able to attack the EAP PWD protocol. And how does this work? Well, the adversary will spoof three clients shown here on the right. And first, the first two clients will associate to the access point. The access point will request the identity of the client. The client will reply with their identity and send the identity to the free radius server. And then the free radius server will tell these clients, okay, I recognize you and both of you now have to perform the PWD authentication algorithm. Now, up to this point, nothing special happened. Instead, the attack only starts now. And in the first part of the attack, the third client will send a special authentication frame to the access point. And the access point will forward this authentication frame over the TLS tunnel, so over the RODSEC connection, through the, to the free radius server. And this will cause the buffer of the access point to slowly fill up with RODSEC frames. And as a result, when client one and two now send their EAP PWD authentication response, then because the access point already has some frames in its buffer, these two frames will be combined into one TLS record. Now, before I explain that in more detail, I want to highlight that the server here will send both these EAP PWD authentication responses in a single physical Wi-Fi frame. And the single physical Wi-Fi frame is called an AMPDU frame. And this means that these two authentication responses will arrive at exactly the same time at the access point. And because the buffer at the access point is slowly starting to get full, the access point will combine both authentication requests in a single TLS record that is sent to, to the free radius server. The free radius server will then process both authentication uh, requests simultaneously in parallel, and it will reply using whichever request finished first, and then it will reply using uh, the other request that finished processing second. So here, the request of the first client finished first at the server, so the server also sends its reply first and then the reply of the second client is sent. And we can see that this order is also reflected at the adversary side, namely the adversary will first receive the reply of the client one, and then it will receive the reply for client two. And the order of these uh, replies allows an adversary to brute force the password of the victim. And in this case, 
the probability of them successfully brute forcing the password of the client is higher than 99%. Or to put that differently, the response order correctly reflects the execution time at the free radius servers in 99% of the time. So only in less than 1% of the cases does the response order incorrectly reflect the execution time at the server. And we can use this information to then uh, perform an offline dictionary attack against the password. So for instance, if we take the Rockyo password dump, which contains about 140 million passwords, then we need to perform 40 measurements. And with those 40 measurements, we have a 80 cents 86% success probability of correctly recovering the password, at least if the password is inside this uh, password dump. On this brute force search costs about $1 on, uh, for instance, on Amazon Cloud Server. So as a quick recap, we now explained direct timing attacks, we explained cross-site timing attacks, and we explained timeless timing attacks over Wi-Fi authentication. And with that, I hand the word back over to Tom. All right, and that brings us to the demonstration. Um, so for this demonstration, I created an application called uh, The Vault, uh, which is basically a place where people can securely share their text documents with military-grade protection. Uh, so users can enter the title of the document and then select uh, the required security level of the other users uh, that well, is required to access the document. So it ranges from 1, uh, which is for public documents, up until 5, which is for really top secret documents. Then the, the user can enter the content and finally uh, post the document. Um, another functionality provided by default is uh, the search functionality, where we can search for strings like hi um, and then uh, get a bunch of results. Um, we can also look for other strings, like for instance Vegas, and then we can see that there is this one single result. Or we can try some more uh, secretive uh, things like the string DEFCON, uh, but unfortunately uh, we don't find any documents containing that string. Um, well, I, I did create the, the, this uh, application, so I know that there is at least one document with the string DEFCON. Um, but the reason why we're not shown this document is because we don't have the right security level. Um, so in this demonstration, what we will try to do is leak the, the password uh, that is in the same document uh, as the one that contains the string DEFCON. Um, and then in order to do so, uh, we will be using these uh, timeless timing attacks. Uh, but before I go into the details there um, of how the attack works, I'll first explain uh, how the search functionality works. So basically what we do is we do a textual search on, on the contents of all the documents uh, using the, pro the query provided by the user. And then if there's at least one document, uh, we need to uh, be able to tell where the current user uh, well, their security level is uh, well high enough to view uh, one of the documents. Um, so getting the security level uh, is done by launching a simple SQL query um, on a database that's located on the same server as the web server. Uh, so the, the well, timing uh, or the latency there is very minimal, uh, but still this is where the timing leak is. Uh, because if there are no documents, uh, which means that there's no match uh, for the text, um, well, we don't have to uh, launch this SQL query. Um, so this means that 
if there's at least one document, the timing will take slightly, uh, like a few microseconds longer. And this is what we uh, leverage in our attack. Uh, so we use uh, Python here, um, and we're using uh, the H2 H2 time library, uh, which is the one uh, that we also used in our research. Um, and uh, it's made public, uh, and I'll be sharing the link later on in the presentation. Um, so what we do is we, we define the URL prefix. So we know uh, that the actual password is prefixed by defcon underscore password equals. Um, and then we, we guess the current character uh, one by one. Uh, so uh, uh, if the, the guess is incorrect, we don't get shown any, uh, well, there will be no documents matching the text uh, search. Uh, so this SQL query will not be executed. Um, and then we compare this to uh, the baseline request where we use a character that's not part of the character set. So we know that it will never have any uh, matching documents. Um, and then we run uh, this with the H2 time library and we get uh, the response order uh, for uh, 15 request pairs. Uh, so basically we uh, determine how many negative results there are. Um, a negative means that uh, the order in which the response uh, arrived uh, was reversed. Um, so if we get for uh, the, the response of R2 before the response of R1, uh, the, the, or, the order uh, is reversed because uh, R1 is sent before R2 typically, or the request is sent before, um, but then the response is received in a different order. Um, and then uh, we determine the percentage of uh, how many uh, well, how many responses were received in uh, reverse order, and then see if this uh, is above or below a certain threshold. And uh, in this case, uh, the threshold was uh, set to uh, eighty percent. Okay, um, so I think now uh, we are ready to actually run the attack, uh, which is done using just Python. Um, and we will be guessing the uh, passwords character by character. Um, so on the topmost line, um, you can see uh, all the characters that have been found so far. Um, so we are at T and 1. Um, now we are also guessing uh, or correctly guessed the letter M. Um, so everything here is uh, being shown in real time. Um, of course to, to make the demo a bit shorter, uh, not the entire character set is used, but we just use some uh, random guesses. Um, but as you can see, uh, so far it's going pretty well. Um, so on the bottom line, uh, we show uh, for each uh, character that's being guessed, the percentage of the responses that arrived in the reverse order. And um, for the characters that were guessed incorrectly, uh, the percentage is uh, somewhat close to 50% because, well, there's a 50-50% chance uh, for every request that's being sent um, that it will uh, arrive before or after, uh, well, um, the other request. So whether the response order is the same or different, the chance is around 50% course there's still a bit of randomness so that's why it's not always 50 but it's sometimes 40 sometimes 60 uh, and um, I believe that we're already getting quite close to uh, extracting the password 
and yeah there it is um, so we managed to uh, in well just under two minutes uh, find that the password is uh, timeless timing um, of course um, in a well real world scenario it would take a bit longer because we would have to guess all the characters one by one uh, but still um, I think it shows that the attack works very uh, well, very well. All right, and that brings us to the conclusion. Um, so we find that these timeless time index are not affected by network jitter at all, uh, neither on the upstream nor the downstream. Uh, so this allows uh, the attacker to perform these uh, remote timing attacks uh, with an accuracy that is similar to as if the attack was launched against the local system. Um, and in order to do so, we need to ensure that both requests are, uh, well, they arrive at the same time at the server. Um, so in order to do so, uh, the attacker can uh, leverage uh, multiplexing um, or uh, if that's not available, uh, it might still be available to uh, leverage uh, tra a transport protocol uh, that enables encapsulation of the uh, request. And um, well, we also find that all the protocols that meet these criteria uh, may be susceptible uh, to timeless time index. And we already, in our research, we created practical attacks against HTTP2 and uh, EPPWD for uh, Wi-Fi authentication. Okay, so with that, I would like to thank you for uh, listening to the presentation. Uh, if, have, if you have any additional questions or remarks or ideas, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us on Twitter. And then finally, uh, you can find this uh, H2 time uh, library that we used uh, in our research, uh, but also in the demo uh, in the following link. And then on the right hand side, uh, you can find the, the sources uh, or the, the source code of the demonstration. So you can play around with it as well. Okay, thank you.